I know one thing. This this area is just I, I can't explain it. It's just like you know, it's very mysterious. It's 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 wide open, and it's kind of like no country for old men. And of course, I'm an old man, but it's also you know there's been so many UFO sightings and uh, I did there was a book in the store about abducted in Roswell and I don't want to read that right now and they always say you probably shouldn't do this by yourself you know some things I do but you know I don't know Roswell, New Mexico. The Roswell incident happened uh, over 75 years ago. And all of that information is being held back, has been covered up for years and years and years, and it's still being covered up. Uh, you know, and I, I just feel like, hey, the people need to know what's going on. Like, we need to know, but only our uh, government officials and others actually know what happened there. Uh, the people that actually discovered it, the crash of the saucer, uh, you know, they were told not to say anything for years and years and years. So we're gonna go to Roswell and check this place out. I've never been, so I'm looking forward to this. Interesting that, uh, of course, you know, last night I stayed at, uh, in Prescott at the Hacienda Inn, and uh, so I'm on the way to Roswell, New Mexico, and I will be driving uh, close to the Magolan Rim, and or they may say it's Magoan Rim. There have been quite a few Bigfoot sightings in that area. And then there's been quite a few UFO sightings. And one of the uh, most famous stories from, hang on, uh, about UFOs and things like that was from uh, the Travis Walton incident who basically uh, you know the story goes that he was abducted by aliens uh, pretty close to uh, Sholo 
in the Apache Sitgreaves Mountains. Uh, I think it was uh, Snowflake was the town. And uh, so he was a lumber, a lumberjack basically uh, cutting wood, him and a crew of about four or five guys. You, you watch the movie. The movie is really good. Um, it's called Fire in the Sky. But anyway, Travis Walton was uh, abducted and then uh, they didn't find him, I can't remember how many days later, three, four, five, maybe a week later, um, naked in a, like a phone booth at a roadside, uh, like gas station, whatever. And, uh, but anyway, uh, who knows what happened? I mean, uh, Travis Walton is carrying that with him and uh, but so there's been uh, the point I'm telling you is there have been some crazy things that's going on on this uh, Magolan or Magoan rim area that we'll be driving through on the way to Roswell So I just got gas in Sholo and while I was pumping gas and uh, cleaning my windows, the gentleman next to me in his truck had this beautiful big giant dog. After, he, he told me what kind it was. Um, I can't remember now, but anyway, it's a big dog. He asked me, he said, are you hunting for Bigfoot here? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm actually on the way to Roswell. I said, I've heard there's been sightings around here. He goes, yeah, there's uh, been two sightings that he knew of in this last couple of weeks. So, I don't know, you, these, these mountains are mysterious. incident that happened back in 1947 and just think about that it's been over 75 years since that incident happened but around the 1st of July in 1947 the military and the aviation saw what was, you know, I guess you'd have to call it UFOs, unidentified flying objects in the air around Roswell and the military base nearby for like July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. And they kept seeing these things. Well, on July the 4th, one of those things went down. They no longer saw it on the radar. Now, when it went down, there was a man and a woman 
that, you know, one, the, the man was not married, the woman was, but they were out and drinking, and so they, they, they saw it crash, but they had been drinking pretty heavily, so they just, uh, didn't pursue to go look for where it was. Well, the next day they did early in the morning and the military was there already uh, taking over uh, the site, but they saw it go down. Now, there were some fire fighting crews that were called to put out this brush fire so they loaded up and went on of course they didn't know what was going on but when they got there they realized oh it was not a brush fire it was a crash and one of the firefighters on the the crew said years later that well he knew that this thing that had crashed was not of this world and he saw <clears throat> there were two dead creatures I guess you could call them aliens and there was one creature alien that was still alive and he told his family including his 12 year old daughter that the the little thing was about he said a size of like a 10 year old really slim but it had a, a big head and it looked like uh, one of these beetles. They call it the the Earth Beetle or something like that. Now, you know, the, the, the daughter, who was 12 years old at the time, tells the story that she, you know, she kind of forgot about it. You know, it's fascinating. But, you know, as kids, we, we go on. We kind of forget about it. She said uh, about a week later, one of her friends who was a uh, police officer who was friends with her father the firefighter he comes to the house and he says I, I gotta show you something and uh, he's, he, had it, he said it's in my hand I'm gonna show it to you but let's go into the kitchen and so he goes into the kitchen and he opens up his hand and drops something on the table. And when it dropped, it spread out like what they said was like water. But it wasn't water. It just looked like it, it was water. And, you know, the 12-year-old daughter, like she would pick it up and said, when it was in your hand, you couldn't even feel it. And it was really small that when you dropped it and opened it up, it spread out and all across. They said that as time went on, they, they tried to burn it. They couldn't burn it. They tried to hammer it. They could, wouldn't break. So it makes you think, what impact had to happen to bring that vessel down? something major from the outside or the inside of that uh, ship you know maybe it crashed and it had like a it, it blew up on its own or you know maybe we had something to make it crash well now if you think about it back in 1945 two years prior to this they were testing atomic bombs out in the desert near Roswell and out in the white sands of New Mexico and so these areas you know was it were, were these 
aliens drawn to this because of the the power in these atomic bombs you know a lot of people may not know but that uh, army air force base uh, there was a group called the 509th bomb wing that's the squad that dropped the bombs on Hiroshima so and Nagasaki so anyway, it's very curious what went on in Roswell and what has been covered up over the years. On the morning of July 4th, 1947, Colonel Blanchard issued a press release if Colonel Blanchard highly respected and decorated airman issued a press release saying they're in possession of a crashed flying disc then you can go to the bank that there was a crashed flying disc Of course, what happened was the, our government, the FCC, quickly got on the story because in 47, the local radio station reported about the saucer, newspapers reported about the saucer, but they were quickly shut down. And then they, our government created a story that it was a weather balloon made out of like tin foil that crashed. It is just unbelievable. This was 1947. So in 1947, if the FCC called a radio station or newspaper said don't print anything don't broadcast anything or we're going to shut you down you pretty much really had no recourse and then today most of the media is in cahoots you can actually turn on one story one angle and it'll be on every station just about thank god we have youtube and twitter that can bring you different aspects nowadays um, to an extent but we have to be careful too because the powers that be could you know if we say something wrong with that we could get shut down so not too long after the story was changed from a flying disc flying saucer crashing to becoming a tenfold weather balloon that crashed. A military police officer showed up the house at the young girl who was 12 years old. After probably going to the fire station to talk to the other firefighters that showed up at the crime the the crash site that day then shows up at the house of the 12 year old and he and his mother were directed to sit at the kitchen table and he explained to the 12 year old daughter and the mother that number one she never heard about the incident number two she never held the material in her hand that would expand when she dropped it on the table and then also 
told them if they had ever the rest of their life mentioned this story, they could be taken off to some concentration camp. Or he even went as far as she could be taken out to the desert and basically disappear. He told, asked the mother, he says, can y'all keep this quiet? And the mother said, yes, she will. The 12 year old lady, well, she's a lady now, but she's 12 years old at the time, said that she never spoke to about this until recently. And uh, if you're interested, you should watch the Roswell cover-up 75 years later um, by Unidentified. Really good documentary. So, some pretty scary things you, you, you know, you don't think is going to happen uh, in the United States, but the government is very powerful. You, you know, this was 1947. So, 16 years later, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And I think most Americans feel there was a cover up there. After Major Marcel came out, looked at the crash site, along with a couple of his corporals, they then dispatched for the firefighter crews to come. And of course, some police officers also came. And as I mentioned, uh, the one firefighter, Dwyer, he said, you know, it was just the craziest thing. They all knew that it was this material was not of this world. And they saw the, the bodies and they also saw one living body. So, you know, they brought, they then put them on the flatbed truck the remaining big part of the the craft um, and carried it on a flatbed truck through the middle of town right on this road right here right on 285 south heading into Roswell because that was the the main military base that was the uh, base where they had the the bombing the bombers B-52 bombers and the elite bombing pilots were stationed there. So, you know, Roswell back in the day was a town of 15,000 people and 7,000 of those people worked on the military base. So, you know, they were this was just after World War II. They were very patriotic people. They were greatly involved in the, you know, helping our troops and getting materials together to make weapons and all that kind of stuff. So they, you know, when the war was over and we had won the war, you know, they, it was only a couple years after the war had ended and they were still very patriotic and would do anything for the country and I think that's what sort of got everybody to go along with the story plus the threats on their lives and their livelihood to keep things quiet but they felt like okay well that's my patriotic duty to stay quiet and many of them did for many years so as I'm a approaching Roswell going through this beautiful desert area 
I come upon a field full of radio towers that were listening for signals from outer space. There's also one of these in Green Bank, West Virginia. So, obviously, we are communicating or getting information from signals in outer space. But I made it into Roswell. And there's the new Roswell water tower. And I checked into the Roswell Inn because why not? I mean, you're in Roswell. I think it, it was fitting. The room was pretty nice. You can check that out right here. And I would say definitely you'd want to stay here when you visit Roswell. There's some other nice places, but this definitely seemed fitting. Pretty nice room. Once in Roswell, you want to check out Invasion Station. The relatives of Frankie Rowe, who was uh, Dwyer, her father was a Dwyer and a firefighter in Roswell. It's a really cool store and you definitely need to check that out. And the town has embraced Roswell. As you can see, there's a McDonald's and a Dunkin' Donuts. So while in Roswell, I took a tour by the Roswell UFO tour, and I'll tell you what, it was fascinating. And right there, we're looking at Lieutenant Hot's house. Now, Lieutenant Hot is an important figure because Colonel Blanchard was the one that asked Lieutenant Hot to write the press release. Hot asked Blanchard if he could go see the material or the crash site. And Blanchard said, no, that's not possible. But he did talk to Major Marcel. And Marcel told him that he was at the site and it was something not of this world. Now this is Major Marcel's house. And there is speculation that under behind this wall and under that floor, there is debris from the UFO. Now, Major Marcel was said to have brought a lot of the debris home, showed it to the family. It was amazing in that later that afternoon, he put it in his car, but did he keep any? Now remember this about Major Marcel because he plays a big part in this story and the cover up in just a little bit. Now as we're driving through the streets of Roswell, I wanted to take a minute and tell you about Mac Brazel. Now Mac Brazel was out riding his ranch the morning after the crash. And he came upon the crash. He saw the, the beings and he saw a huge debris field. Braswell gathered up a bunch of the debris and took it into the sheriff at Roswell and told him, hey, you need to clean up all this mess. And he didn't get there till the next day. But this kind of alarmed the military because they felt like they had got everything under control. They had gathered the, the debris and all that, but they didn't know Brazel had already been there. The sheriff told uh, Brazel that it was not his jurisdiction. That's Lincoln County. You'd have to take it up with Lincoln County. But then he notified the radio station. Right there on the left is where 
the former police station sheriff's office was. While I'm telling what happened to Mac Brazel, this is the land very close to Mac Brazel's property. And like I mentioned before, he was out riding the range when he found all this debris. Well, after the sheriff put him off, but contacted the military and the radio station, Brazel talked to the radio station guy and told him quite an astonishing story. Brazel told Kevin Joyce from the radio station that he had seen the crash, he had seen the debris, he said it was not of this world. He went on to say that he also saw two dead aliens and one living. He said the odor was awful. The next day he was called in back to Joyce's radio station and I think he was being set up by the military because as you're listening to the UFO tour guide tell the story, you'll see what happened to Mac Brazel. While waiting to meet with Joyce, Brazel went to this restaurant called Martin's Capital Cafe and he had lunch. And he cannot suspect that he's just had his last meal as a free man. Because when KGFL comes into sight, and it's now the cleaning services location just to the left of that gap down there, when KGFL comes into sight, Mac Brazel sees not three white cars parked in front of the radio station, he sees army jeeps filled with military policemen. They're here to take him into custody. They've been looking for him. Looks again. That was the historic location of radio station KGFL. So the military police carried Brazel up to the Roswell Army Air Force Base. And that's the location of the check-in and if your documents weren't in order, they would pull you over side, take you to this building and see what was going on. Well, that's where they say that Brazel spent seven days in that little building trying to make sure that they got his story correct, which later Brazel recanted his story and went along with the military directions. Brazel later was so shook up, he said, I wish I had never seen that debris field. Well, in the meantime, the two alien bodies and the alien that was still alive were transported by the flatbed truck that rolled up Route 285 that I showed you earlier, right past the courthouse. And they were brought to one of the hangars right here. And that field right in front of us is the field where the airplanes, the bombers, would fly out. Now, this is the hangar where they brought the bodies. And on that addition on the end of the building... On the left side was where the bodies were, and they say the odors were just awful. Some say it even smells today. So a few days after the incident, Major Massell walked out of this building, which now has been refurbished as a school. He walked out on this parking lot, carrying his debris full of what he thought was alien material. They carted him off into a B-52 bomber, well-secured airplane. And there was another package that was brought aboard, but he didn't know anything about that. 
What Major Marcel didn't know was that when he got to General Ramey's office in Fort Worth, he was escorted into Major Ramey's office, and then he came back and they opened up this package, and he's sitting on the floor looking through this package. General Ramey says, here's your crashed UFO. And they took these pictures of Marcel opening up this package. Well, the look on Major Marcel's face was something that his son, Jesse, would later say was that expression of, really? Are you kidding me? Now, right here on this location is where they took the bodies out of the hangar because of the smell was so bad. They brought it to the emergency room of the hospital. And here was where they supposedly did an autopsy on the two deceased aliens. Now, this building has changed, obviously. Well, this is the home of Dan Wilmot, where he and his wife were sitting on the front porch about a week before all these incidents took place and they saw a UFO flying north over the town. So uh, right now I'm heading out towards Foster Ranch, which is where the crash site occurred. And um, I'm just gonna, obviously I can't, go on to the ranch and explore the ranch because uh, it's private property. Just want to get close to the area, take some photos, and uh, of course the crash site's not, not right on the road. Well, I followed this road to this point, and from this point, you're supposed to go on this road, but now, I guess since the book has been published, they fenced this off, they built a fence, and somebody else owns the property. So, I cannot go any further, but about 1.7 miles, uh, is the debris field. I tried. miles on this uh, Bureau of Land Management roads which if y'all have been on those you know what they're like and uh, but now I shouldn't say not, uh, it was only probably the last 25 miles that I've been on Bureau of, of Land Management roads so may, probably not even 25 so the first uh first part of the ride I was on the, just the uh, like a county route or a state route 246 so 
So I've spent a lot of time today looking for the crash site and um, like everything else about this uh, incident, they have got it locked down. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. And, but you can also support me uh, by signing up on Patreon at patreon.com slash frontiersman adventures. You can join as a member. Either of those helps support me and, and uh, on these travels. Mm -hmm.